conversation on social issues. My name is Kimberly Tate, and I'm one of the librarians here. So I see some new faces, which is great. And for those who don't know, this is a weekly series hosted by the library because we see this as an extension of our charge to promote the um, exchange of information and the free sharing of ideas. So we ask everyone to feel free to participate and share their opinions and perspectives. And I'd like for this to remain a safe place for everyone. So even if you don't agree with every single thing you hear from the other attendees, um, or maybe read about it in one of the books that I put up on the whiteboard that relate to this topic, we want everyone to be able to share and express their ideas. At the end of this discussion, I'll ask you to fill out a brief survey, letting us know what you think about the series, what you'd like to see, how we can improve. We want this to remain relevant and educational and fun, if possible. So next week, Joanne Factor from Strategic Living, Safety and Self-Defense Training, LLC, will be discussing domestic violence in the media. But today, join me in welcoming John Martinez, our first co -C speaker of the series, who is an ESL instructor and co-chair of the AFT Seattle Human and Civil Rights Committee as we discuss anti-miscegenation laws in America. John. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for Kimberly and the library for hosting me and allowing us to share ideas. So I want to present uh, a quick look at anti-miscegenation laws in the United States. Miscegenation was a word that was made in the, the middle of uh, the 19th century to describe the marriage of people who had different skin colors or different nationalities or ethnicities. But back then, this word miscegenation means the mixing. And of course, the history of the United States is mostly the history of anti-miscegenation. So let's take a look at some just more modern images of what we call interracial marriages, sometimes uh, with drama or with uh, different uh, kinds of entertainment. We deal with these issues. So this is one way that people are familiar with interracial marriage. There are some other forms of uh, interracial marriage, and we'll talk a little bit about Japanese and American, uh, but also even comic book, book forms. Sometimes people push the topics and mix the subject with popular comic books or culture. So please take a look at this map of the United States, because in 1967, the United States Supreme Court passed, uh, made a decision in a, in, a, in a case called Loving uh, v. Virginia that struck down the anti-miscegenation laws in the United States. This was in June 1967. At, the at that time, there were, in U there were 16 states in the United States that still had laws prohibiting marriages between white and black or white and Asian, many, and I'll explain many of those. But you can see that th those states of gray were mostly in the South that still had the laws in 1967. But look at the blue ones or going to the West. Those states also had different laws against mixed marriages uh, until uh, uh, they repealed their laws before recently, before 1967. But one thing about these maps is even though these states had the formal law or they had in their constitution, their state constitution, some law against intermarriage, these other states that are in white may have had at some time some law or these states in white had many people who still supported the idea of no interracial marriage. And a lot of times those were state officials or, or uh, marriage or uh, justice of the peace who decided to, on their own that they would stop mixed marriages from happening in their state. So it was a battle all across the United States. And I think that's one important thing for us to take away from our conversation today is every state had to fight over this issue. So let's begin with uh, early United States history. Of course, the 13 colonies and the slave trade was uh, 
just beginning in 1620 and it just became very lucrative. But even in colonial North America, you can see that they had to make a change in their culture. Because in colonial North America, there were many cases of master-servant relations, and some of these were between white and white. Many uh, young people from England would come as indentured servants, so they would work for a master. At the same time, blacks were coming into, Africans were being brought into North America, and they were also serving a master. But this relation of master-servant changed over time. It needed to change into one of master-slave. So laws were passed later on in Maryland, and you can see this list, a partial list of colonies that were introducing laws. So this is all before American independence. You can see the colonies were introducing laws that were defining laws prohibiting white people from marrying blacks. Uh, even French Louisiana had a law that was mandated by the king at that time, Louis XV. Okay, so first starting one, one of the earliest was Maryland, uh, and on this chart one of the later was Georgia. But let's look at the next. Okay, let's look at the next. But part of part of prohibiting marriage between black and white was the question of enforcement. Most states said if you marry black and white, the law that marriage is illegal and you say void or null. It's not, it doesn't happen. But they needed more muscle in order to control people to really avoid getting involved with different races. So Maryland, one of the first, and later Virginia, were passing laws that actually punished white women even more if they were involved in an interracial marriage. This will be a very important part of our story because this is how most states would continue to enforce their anti-miscegenation laws by punishing people who, in, who participated in those relations. And finally here, in 1750, the state of Georgia actually began to nullify, that is, go ahead, go ahead and sit down this way, began to nullify marriages that already occurred. Because of course, you can't control everybody, so some people did get married, some black and white, black and white and Indian did get married. The state of Georgia was looking for them. And if they found them, they said, your marriage is now null. It is no longer legal. So that was also a big development in these relations. From independence to the Civil War, all the states got involved in passing some kind of law prohibiting whites from marrying blacks. And you can see most of these states are in the South, but also there was a lot of antagonism towards black people, so states in the north and territories also began passing their own laws. Uh, racism was very strong. Even though later on we will find out that many states were opposed to slavery, many people did not like Africans. So they did not want Africans in their state or territory, and if they came, they wanted to control them. So here's a list of all the states, most of the states, I think, and territories that uh, instituted some kind of a law that said a white person cannot marry a black person. And you can see that Washington State there in 1855 also passed the law. Uh, the last, one of the last, uh, right before the Civil War. Okay? And also in the District of Columbia. Some of these laws would be repealed, some would come back, so the, the history changes over time. But of course, the Civil War was a major uh, conflict in the United States that had to deal with this question of not just um, anti miscegenation laws, but also racial discrimination, slavery, and the, and the freedom of black people to enjoy full civil rights. So don't copy this, but I just want you to get an idea of just 
how much and how fast these kinds of laws were passed. Now, even though the states passed these anti-miscegenation laws, the states still were promoting marriage, traditional marriage, mostly between white people. Most states also let whites marry Indians, even though they had some laws, because whites, especially the men, marrying Native American people was a way for the states and society to acquire more land and more resources. So many of those laws were on the books, but not enforced. But states in general wanted to promote marriage because marriage was, a, was one legal documented way of following the property and fortune and the profits and the tools and the houses that people made, bought, sold. So marriage was very important for social stability. So even though the states were passing laws against interracial marriages, all other marriages were getting facilitated. So states even established common law marriages where two people living together can stand before uh, a county official and say, we are now married, and the county official says, okay, good. And states would recognize the marriages from the other states called comity, and also states began to recognize marriages by others, other, uh, other traditions. Uh, some white people married Native Americans with Native American ceremonies. So those were considered uh, okay at some time. When the United States conquered the Mexican, Spanish and Mexican territory, they conquered Spanish Florida, who have conquered Mexican Texas, uh, those courts also recognized the marriages from those areas. So marriage was always an important function of social stability and property management. So it was very important. But as states were passing laws against interracial marriages, I mentioned that they punished women for participating. They punished women more. But actually, the other laws that were being passed at, at the same time were laws against un being, being together but not married. And there were references to, many, many references to adultery, uh, bigamy, polygamy, uh, fornication, but the same societies that were promoting marriage were also promoting laws to punish people if they were living together, not in any legal way. And the law, there were many laws on the books used to enforce the, the people to get married. But look at the last point. It's used, these laws against this illicit sex were used as a club to prosecute mixed race marriages ruled illegal. So sometimes a marriage was just said, this is illegal, doesn't exist anymore, but we're going to punish you because you're having sex. So the combination of the two laws is what made this movement very powerful. And it was, uh, and what, this is what people learned to live with. There were free blacks in the United States. And many times in the South, the free blacks would uh, visit and, and associate with the slaves. In the north, the free blacks had businesses, they had uh, small farms. Uh, but as this movement to control interracial marriage grew, uh, black codes were also introduced. Black codes to establish not just the control and the, of, of slaves, but also free, free people who were also black. And probably some of the worst conditions were the last two. Uh, blacks, free blacks, were sometimes told that you could not participate in a court hearing, you could not sue a white man, you could not testify against a white person, you could not be a witness or a juror. And there were many other ways of controlling, or trying to control free black people. But you can see slaves could not enter into contracts or marry without the permission of the owner. So these were laws that were also passed trying to control the behavior of black people. So marriage, in this time in the United States, was really, really fundamental to the promotion and stability of property and the developing economic relationships, trade. 
So his language was so strongly associated with whiteness, freedom, property, and propriety that interracial marriage threatened slavery in a way that interracial sex did not. And let me just say one word about interracial sex because, of course, at that time, people used it to control blacks. And they had theories and ideas about the behavior of black people. But the real vicious, predatory interracial sex came from whites, white men, white plantation owners who abused and raped the female slaves on their plantations. And thousands and thousands of mixed race children were born to the plantation owners. And their wives just looked the other way, but in many plantations you would see the slaves, the, the slave owners and the slaves, and you would see the children of the slave plantation owner. So interracial sex was made to look like a problem from the black people, but actually it was the other way around. It was a very vicious uh, situation that the slaves had to live under on these plantations. <coughs> the Civil War came, trying to resolve the issue of who will control the government, the industrial north or the slave south. And in 1864, President Lincoln was uh, running for re-election. The Civil War was beginning to be uh, was beginning to move in favor of the Union of the North. So the North was our North Party was beginning to make victories and progress in the Civil War. So the people who opposed Lincoln were beginning to think, "My God, the, the North will win, the South will lose. What's going to happen next?" And this is where the word miscegenation is invented. Because now the opponents of Lincoln, the opponents of the North, are going to try to scare you. Scare you into believing that if Lincoln wins, the North <coughs> will be like this. There will be a mixing of white and black. Which for the majority of people was a terrible idea. So this is, this is scare. This is a scare tactic. Uh, to, to use, and this one was being used against President Lincoln's re-election. But of course there were more. There was just, this was all over the country, and these ideas were uh, being spread around. But still, the Union Army and the generals knew that they had to continue to their, their war against the South and defeat it in order to promote the dominant the <coughs> interests of the North. But the people, more scare tactics. So people were saying, yeah, if Lincoln wins, if the North wins, if the South loses, all the traditions of the South, of separation, will be lost, and they use these kinds of scare tactics. Amalgamation, using the mix, it's another word for a mixing, right? <clears throat> Was another word used to describe what may happen if the South loses. So a lot of states, a lot of people responded to this scare tactic. And they said, oh my god, the blacks are coming. So many states, during and right after the Civil War, strengthened their laws. Now they started to make the mixed marriage a crime. Before, it was just illegal, you can't do it, go away. Now they're saying if you, make, if you, make, if you marry someone, it can be a felony. Five years, ten years in prison for both of you. So many, so these states, the Civil War ended and was from 1861 to 1865. So these states were uh, uh, scared and these people were using the opportunity to make even stronger laws against interracial marriage. But with the end of the Civil War and the defeat of the South, finally the Union Army generals and knew that they had to force change onto the South. And in 1866, the Congress passed the Civil Rights Act uh, that declared citizens of every race and color held the right to make and enforce contracts, give evidence, and to inherit and to enjoy the full and equal benefits of all laws as enjoyed by white 
citizens. So what's important here is this takes away the black codes. Now the, the slaves are free, they're black, but they can now make contracts, okay? Uh, to go under contract, to give evidence, to participate in legal proceedings. So the Civil Rights Act was very important. And the 14th Amendment passed a little bit afterwards promises to protect the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States <laughs> by offering equal protection of the laws. That would become a very contentious uh, phrase because, of course, people who want equality wanted everyone to be treated equal, but the people who wanted to, anti who wanted to separate the races were going to use that phrase in a different way. So these were important legal uh, steps in Washington, D.C. But in the South, after the defeat of the Southern Army, black people were free. They organized themselves into political groups. And with the help of the Union Army, the Blue Soldiers, they were able to form new governments and begin to pass laws to overturn discrimination from the, from the past. Uh, they wanted to protect black women from the predation of the, of the plantation owners. They wanted to allow blacks to have farms and to own businesses, to work in factories. And with the help of the Union Army, this was called radical reconstruction for about 10 years in the United States. With the help of the Union Army and laws coming from Washington, D.C., people in the South were able to push back some of the worst laws and customs of the, old plant, of the old plantation south. So some, some states, you see on the bottom, actually repealed their laws. There was actually a feeling of, well, slavery was terrible. Let's, um, let's move away from that experience. Some, slave, some states repealed the law. They took their laws back, which included, you can see, 1868 Washington, okay? our, uh, our state, uh, which was a territory, I think. Uh, repealed that law at that time. So it seemed like there was some progress during the time of radical reconstruction for equality. But later on, radical reconstruction was slowly defeated because the northern, the Union states in the north, Washington, D.C., and the powerful industrialists, they wanted to build industry and the railroad, and they didn't want to they wanted stability in the South, and they wanted basically the old white people to come back in the South and take control again. Part of the movement to return to the old system was in the North, one of the states in the North is Indiana. And Indiana had some of the worst laws against free black people. Indiana was one of the first states to make interracial marriage a felony, a crime. So Indiana, the state of Indiana in the North argued that the Civil Rights Act applies only to the South, not to them, that the 14th Amendment applies only to the former slaves, not the free blacks, and that the Indiana politicians argue that the state has a need to protect white women as part of the integrity of white people. And the case called Gibson dealt with a couple where the man was black and the woman was white. And that combination of a black man and a white woman made people really fearful. They really thought, oh, this is a terrible relationship. So many people in Indiana supported this decision uh, from their state court. So this decision called Gibson established the principle that marriage was really a state issue, not a federal issue. And that the state could prosecute, make it a crime, and the federal government could not interfere. But more than that, now this decision from Indiana gave the states in the South a second win, a second chance to come back with their old laws and put them back on the books especially as they were defeating the, the, the political parties of the black people in the South. 
So states begin to bring back anti-miscegenation laws. Alabama, and Alabama actually added that, added that to its con state constitution. Texas, Mississippi, Florida, Arkansas, Louisiana. So as they, as these, as the white people took back control of the South, they started to bring back these laws again. So what did the U.S. Supreme Court do all this time? Uh, nothing, really. The United U.S. Supreme Court were mostly, for many, many years, mostly Southern Southerners who were justices. And they were just like everyone else in U.S. society, opposed to interracial marriage. At times, 99% of the white people in the South were against interracial marriage. So the justices never got involved with any issue regarding interracial laws. But they did get involved with one issue called Pace v. Alabama, 1882. Again, this is a case in Alabama where a couple, a black man and a white woman, were living together. They said they were married. The state of Alabama said, no, you're not married. We have laws against that. And not only you're not married, but you're having sex together, we're going to punish you. Now, Alabama had a, a system where they punished people for living together without marriage, illicit sex. And the way it was in Alabama, if you were white and white living in illicit, having illicit sex, you get one year punishment. If you're black and black, one year punishment. But if you're white and black, it's five years for each of them. So this was a disparity. And this is what the Supreme Court said uh, was okay. Because if you're white and white, you will get a light punishment, and you can, or you can marry, right, to reduce the sentence. If you're black and black, you can also marry and reduce the sentence, or even escape punishment. But if you're white and black, then you cannot marry. So the stigma or the, or the, the problem of your illicit sex becomes uh, even stronger. So you, will, you will get more punishment. And that disparity, that difference, is what the Supreme Court upheld in 1882. That was the law of the land until 1863, when the Supreme Court in McLaughlin v. Florida overturned that whole justification for that kind of treatment. But I think you see here how, together, laws against illicit sex and laws against interracial marriages work together to punish people and control people. So this would be the law of the land for almost 80 years. The anti-miscegenation laws go west. Trade with, uh, of course, the gold rush in California and the comp in uh, the 1850s and the completion of the Transcontinental Railroad in 1866. The big movement west. And the people who come west are the same people from the other states who lived under anti-miscegenation laws. They didn't like mixing. Oregon leads the way. Oregon passes anti-miscegenation laws in 1866. Now they're saying you, you, whites cannot marry Negroes, mulattoes, Chinese, Kanakas, or Native Hawaiians. 1866. Okay, so previously it had been whites and blacks. Now these states are organizing are passing laws against other groups. Because in the western states, there were many Asian immigrants coming to work here, to work the mines, build the railroads, farm, and making business and being profitable. But for the white people, they were competition. So they needed to control the competition. There's, they passed these laws, and other laws too. Other laws about who can buy land and own land in the west. Other states expand their list. Nevada, white cannot marry Indian or Chinese. Again, Idaho, Arizona. Indians or Mongolians. That became a very popular word. Or in Wyoming, person of Asiatic 
blood. And of course, in the West, some of you may know history, but there was a very powerful movement out of California and the West Coast against Chinese. This is an 1865 photo from a very popular American magazine. It shows uh, not only an interracial couple, two of them really, Chinese and uh, the white woman, but look at the church behind them. It's not a Christian church. Can anybody see? Confucius. It's the Church of Confucius. So not only are the white people losing their white women to Chinese, now they're going to lose white women to Christianity. So this was from a very popular magazine. Uh, I think it was Harper's. Chinese, were a lot of agitation and a lot of campaign against Chinese. Later on, it was against Japanese. When the, when the Chinese were um, excluded in 1882, the Japanese would also come a little later, and they were also excellent uh, farmers, excellent businessmen, very well educated. More competition for white people. So the, uh, there was anti-Japanese uh, agitation, say, again, in, in the western states, against Japanese laundries and businesses, and against intermarriage. Here's a Seattle newspaper. So what happened? That Seattle newspaper reported a story that in San Francisco, two people wanted to get married. They worked and they belonged to the same Christian church. He's Japanese and she's white, but she's also the daughter of a bishop from that church. So of course the newspapers make an announcement, nice people will get married, but right away other people say, wow, this is terrible. This is 1909, San Francisco. So the in California at that time, it was uh, not possible to get married. The people thought they could because they were middle class, respectable, church people. But then people said, no, in California, no. So the, so the couple had to travel north in Portland, Oregon. Nobody would uh, let them, nobody would marry them. Even in Washington State, remember, Washington State had no anti-miscegenation laws. But still, people in different cities, officials in different cities, decided, I will say no. Okay? In Vancouver, Washington, Tacoma, the mayor and other people said, no, no way. These people are not getting married here. Finally, in Seattle, the mayor said, marry them and let them go. Because they wanted no more problems, no more publicity. But it was a drama that was played up in the big newspapers. So in the early 1915s, 1920s, with the defeat of the South, defending white, the purity of white women became big business. Became big business. And it was used to promote a, a movie. Here's a scene of an of a actor playing a predatory black man being captured by the Ku Klux Klan. And finally, the white women <coughs> saved and protected by the white raiders. Okay? Very popular movie. 1910, 1911, Jack Johnson, the heavyweight boxer, defeated all the white opponents. But personally, he was also very reckless in his romances. But he, made, he married uh, several times to white women and just created a scandal. And people said, oh, how terrible. The governors were saying, oh, this is terrible. Um, his behavior was terrible. There should be a law. But he lived in Chicago, in Illinois, that had no laws against interracial marriages. But people said, but, but because he lived in Chicago, one congressman said, we should have an amendment to the US Constitution prohibiting interracial marriage forever. But it didn't, of course, it didn't pass. But people were very upset about the behavior of this man. At the same time in the United States, reformers were, and scientists were saying, oh, marriages can produce weak babies and deformed babies. Eugenics was also a very powerful movement in the United States, where people were saying, we have to sterilize weak people, sterilize sick people. We can't allow them to have babies and create more problems. 
which included, and in the, in the thinking of these people, included blacks. Okay, they included black people, Mexicans, sometimes Italians, in their list of people who had, in, who were inferior and had problems and should not be allowed to marry and to have babies. So this was a very powerful movement that helped anti-miscegenation legislation. But there was resistance. There was resistance. Um, Ida B. Wells from 1890s, 1900, 1910, a young woman, she wrote very good newspaper articles exposing the lies that people used against black men, saying that black men were predators and that they and that that's the reason why so many black men were killed in the street by lynching, because people said, oh, he tried to kiss a white woman, or he, tried, he was disrespectful to a white woman. She wrote many articles exposing that lie, but more importantly and more controversially, she wrote many articles saying all white women are not virtuous either. And for that time, that was a very powerful statement. Nobody wanted to hear it, but she was brave enough to stand up and, and to push that truth. W.E.B. Du Bois, also a leader of uh, intellectual and very strong uh, leader for, for black rights, for equality, was also um, the first national president of the NAACP. He also would uh, lead the campaign against anti-miscegenation laws. There were some people, though, who thought separation of the races was okay. So they did, they, in fact, they would tell their own people to stay in your own group. Don't marry outside. Uh, people like Booker T. Washington or Marcus Garvey or the young Malcolm X, who was a minister in the Nation of Islam. So, of course, there were other other people who said the opposite, but of course these people were concerned about their own people, the safety of their women, the tragedy of uh, predation upon uh, black women, and also the survival of the race, especially with so much anti-black violence in society. So one thing they said is maybe we should stay in our own group. And of course this was also something that groups in, of Japanese and Chinese would say too, but these were the two major uh, representatives in the black community. But immigration continued. The next group that came to the United States were Filipinos, Koreans, coming to the West Coast. So now, again, this movement to expand the definitions of exclusion. Uh, and this is, this is the time of, of uh, the NAACP of uh, when uh, Ida B. Wells and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois were beginning their campaigns, but the states were not adding more language to who cannot marry whites. You can see Mongolians, Malays. Malays was used mostly to target Filipinos. Koreans, Malayan, Mongolians, Malays, and Hindus. So the movement continued against people. And in 1924 in Virginia, this man, Walter Plecker, he, he worked for the government. He decided to make anti-miscegenation anti laws a science with documentation everybody's recorded whenever you're born or you go to the hospitals whenever any little paper about you is written out that information will be collected so the state of Virginia can know who you are where you're from and who you cannot marry so this man was uh, very important in developing a very strong system of control in the state of Virginia most states did not have this kind of control. Most states was just like, it was up to someone to look at you and guess, oh, you're white, you're white, you're not. But uh, this man developed a very strong system. And this will be important because this is the state where loving, the, the loving couple uh, will challenge anti-miscegenation laws. Meanwhile, in Washington state, right here at home, uh, Ku Klux Klan activity was uh, also, it goes up and down. This was a time when it was going up. Ku Klux Klan activity, there's a nice marriage there, everybody's happy. Over here is a big rally in, uh, somewhere in Seattle at that time in the 1930s. 
But this was happening across the country. And, but what did happen in Seattle was there, there was more fight back. Labor Black Asian Alliance defeated a, a, a couple of state senators uh, in 1935, 1937, tried to pass a law in the state of Washington for anti-miscegenation. Uh, but a coalition of different groups got together to protest. They went to Olympia. They had rallies in the churches. And they were able to stop the attempt to pass laws in Washington State. The U.S. Immigration Service at this time also developed a dictionary of races, telling who's who. It's a very large dictionary. It's, not, it's online, too, if you ever want to look at it. Caucasian people, the white people, some of uh, Aryan, Semitic, other groups that they consider. So instead of just looking at your skin color, now they want to look at more at your culture, your ethnography, your geographic origins. But they still wanted to use this kind of technical information in order to support their system of anti-miscegenation. The Immigration Service and the immigration courts were making decisions about who can become a citizen and who cannot. Because at the law of this time in the United States, to be naturalized as a, as a US citizen, you have to be a free white. So who's free white? Well, here's a man from Syria, Costa Jordan, Azure. The immigration court said, yeah, you're OK. You're, you're white. You're Caucasian. That's what they said. You're Caucasian. The Syrian people are Caucasian. Come on in. This other guy, Bhagat Sin Din from India, he also said he was Aryan, northern India. And he said, yeah, I want to come be a citizen. They said, no. The judge said, the judge said, yeah, you're Aryan. You're part of the Caucasian group. But to me, you don't look like it. So the judge said, no. So these are the kinds of, kinds of uh, experiences people had. 1927, Takao Zawa applied for um, to be a citizen. And he claimed he was very white. Some Japanese are very, very white. So he said, yeah, I'd like to be a citizen. But the court said no. So actually, it was a Supreme Court decision. The Supreme Court said that a white person is, a uh, white person is synonymous with a person of the Caucasian race. So just being white is not enough. You had to be a Caucasian race. So the Japanese were lost the right to naturalization. So these were the fights going on. A man in New York, now New York had no, no anti-miscegenation anti laws, but a man in New York, very wealthy man, wanted to divorce his wife. All of a sudden he discovers, oh my goodness, she's black, I want to divorce her. So in the court, in the trial, they made her strip so, they, so she could prove, so they could prove to the court that she was black. But she won. He got no divorce, and he just paid her to live separately for the rest of her life. So unfortunately, of course, after World War II and the war against the Nazis, the campaign here at home continued. The civil rights and the NAACP with Thurgood Marshall were challenging laws around housing, employment, education. Marriage and freedom was kind of low on the list of the NAACP. And you can see how people say race mixing is communist and it's, they're protesting in the South. Also after World War II, many soldiers married young women in other countries. And they wanted to bring their brides to the United States. Um, most could, but Congress passed the law saying, no, you could not bring your bride from Japan. For about a year and a half, those soldiers could not bring their bride from Japan until 1947, when Congress passed a law to let the soldiers in Japan bring their Japanese wife to the United States. That was the participation of the Japanese American Citizens League, JACL. Also on the right, the ACLU also got involved with fighting these laws. 1948, California passed a the California Supreme Court said anti miscegenation laws were unconstitutional. They said it was a fundamental right of free people, that the state used very vague ideas of what is uh, a race. Also, race was a religious liberty. So 
So California State Supreme Court was the first state court to rule these laws unconstitutional. And here's the people who fought it. She's a Chicana, and he's black. But the court, but at the time when they applied for the license, somebody said, oh, to the woman, oh, you're white. You can't marry a black guy. But they fought it, and they won. Um, after that, the J JACL, Japanese American Citizens League, J and the ACLU, helped push back the laws in some of the states. So Oregon, from 51 to 63, these states repealed their laws. A couple of them kept their laws. So after World War II, after the fight against Nazi discrimination and Nazi racism, most, most states were beginning to listen closer to these new arguments. But the, after the states in the West, the NAACP decides to go back to the South and fight the laws there in the South. So they agreed to represent a couple in Florida. McLaughlin was his name. Her name was Hoffman. It, it involved a case of cohabitation. Uh, they were not married, but they were living together. And because of just living together, they were given excessive punishment. The Supreme Court said no. Excessive punishment, disparate punishment, is unconstitutional. And what the Supreme Court did here was reverse that previous decision from 1882 called Pace. So it didn't, they didn't change the marriage laws, but they did challenge the premise of disparate punishment for unmarried people. So that's, that's what it did. It repeals the previous 1882 decision. It overturned cohabitation charges or illicit sex. But it also says invidious discrimination, and this will be important for loving you, because what invidious discrimination does is it says you are making laws against, you are making laws that will be used against a group against black people. So that expression right in the middle, indigenous discrimination will be important. Finally, the last case that I think most people are aware of, Loving v. Virginia. In 1958, they got married in Washington, D.C. They, they lived in Virginia, but Virginia had those strong laws I mentioned. When they went back to live in Virginia, they were arrested, put on trial. They pled guilty. They said, yes, Your Honor, we're guilty. And the judge said, well, I can give you each five years in the jail, but I'm going to be nice. I'm not going to throw you in jail, but you have to leave Virginia. And you cannot come back together for 25 years. You can come back separately. But you cannot come back to see your family and friends together for 25 years. So they said, OK. So for three years, that's how they lived. They lived in Washington, D.C. Finally, she wrote a letter to uh, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. He sent a letter to ACLU, and they said, we're going to fight this. We're going to fight this. They asked the, the original uh, judge if he would reconsider the sentence of 25 years. He said, no, I won't. This is what the judge said. He said, Almighty God created the race of white, black, yellow, Malay, and red, and he placed them on separate continents. The fact that he separated the race show, shows that he did not, did not intend for the races to mix. This was really the common thread to a lot of uh, justification for these laws. And 19, this is 1963, I think, 64. But the case went to the Supreme Court, the ACLU representing the, the the, the Loving, Richard Loving, and uh, Mildred Jeter. They asked the court, can, a color, can the color of a person's skin be a test to determine criminal conduct? Where is, where is due process from our uh, amendments? And, and, in, and, in, and invidious discrimination in Virginia is being used to create white supremacy, uphold white supremacy. The JACL also participated before the Supreme Court, and the NAACP also added arguments to help the loving. Finally, uh, June 12, 1967, after so many challenges, after movements and protests, the Supreme Court rules unanimously that Virginia's Racial Integrity Act of 1924 and its anti-miscegenation anti laws are unconstitutional. That means all the states now 
will be challenged. Um, and most of them, and uh, all anti-miscegenation laws are now unconstitutional in the United States. But it still took about 10 years to get those laws off the books and to change people's behavior. It was still a fight to protect people's rights. And finally, even Malcolm X, later in his life, he changed his ideas. He says, I believe in recognizing every human being as, hu as a human being, neither white, black, brown, nor red. When you are dealing with humanity as one family, there is no question of integration or intermarriage. It's just one human being uh, marrying another human being or one human being living with another human being. So he changed also later in his life. And I think he would have been happy to see Loving New Virginia. Uh, today, 6.3% of all marriages are from different races. And here are some suggested books also that I use for the presentation and some others about uh, race discrimination in marriage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.